Book Talk begins at 19 minutes and 23 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 626, Learning in Public. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Well, hello. How are you? I'm sad my mom left today. So that's, you know, that. Health-wise, I am still where I was before, but that's actually where the learning in public comes from. It's something that we do, right? By being here together, we are learning in public, as it were. We have our little public group, and anyone can be here, and it's all great. And it reminds me, oh, back in the day, I remember seeing comments from listeners saying, oh, you're so brave for knitting in public, I could never do that. And at the time, I thought, wow, really? Because it's a conversation starter on the subway, for one thing, and usually only with nice people because they're curious. But I started thinking about the kinds of things that we see on Instagram and on YouTube and all over the web, Facebook and everything, where people have these manicured and curated lives. And my life ain't nothing like that. So I have seen some artists, some watercolor artists now starting to show the failed attempts at a piece that they then do a tutorial on where it is, you know, spectacular at the end just so you can see the processes that they go through. They show you the thumbnails and they're figuring out, should I put this there or there or there? Because most watercolors that are really, really beautiful have been curated. A tree gets moved to put it more into the golden ratio, that kind of thing. Well, you know me in learning, so the learning in public that I'm doing now, I've just started, is kind of microblogging over on Substack. It started kind of out of desperation because, as I've mentioned, my long-term memory is not so good, or <laughs> my short-term memory is not so good. See, I can't even remember that it's no good. And and yet I need to keep researching and trying to find things that I can do to alleviate some of these symptoms so that I can maybe actually have a job again. And microblogging is something that people used to do. I think it started on Twitter because you could use your Twitter thread as kind of a mini microblog. And Andrew's been telling me for a long time that I needed to get on Substack and start writing there. And so I thought, ah, well, here is the opportunity. And then I was really propelled into it by stumbling across a and I guess you'd call it an article, an essay, um, by Swix, S-W-Y-X. It's his initials of his Chinese name and his English names put together. And he pronounces it Swix. He's a coder, a developer, and he started this learning in public thing because just like the stories of the guys who invented personal computers in their garages in Northern California, it went faster because they were working in their garages at night and they would go out and say, hey, come see what I figured out. And everybody would go learn from that person's next achievement. And then they would jump ahead with theirs and everybody's sharing the information. It becomes super important when you're dealing with something that's systemic because nobody is an expert in everything. And so an ear, nose and throat doctor may tell me one thing whereas a gastroenterologist may tell me another thing and a speech therapist might tell me something different. And yes, speech therapy is actually part of the pantheon of doctors that I am slowly wending my way through. I thought speech therapy was kind of 
odd. But then I thought, well, no, maybe it's like stutterers, um, that it's not so much a mouth shape or a tongue placement thing, but that there is actually a cognitive thing that's happening. And it turns out that, yes, the, the speech therapy is working on brain fog. And one of the things that you're supposed to do is, A, keep track of how you're feeling and what exhausts you, and also what kind of wiped out do you get after different activities so I started doing that, and yeah, and that was when I came across Swix's post on learning in public, and I thought, oh, wow, okay. No, actually, I have to keep all of this information in a place where I can tag it, and it would be a shame if I didn't use everything that I'm finding and share it with whoever else might need it. It's really hard to find some of this information, and it is super hard to parse the national medical trial database. And it's, it's really cruel when you're dealing with something like this where your brain is just not quite up to speed and then you hit the hardest websites you've ever had to deal with in your life. It's just the cruel irony of it was not lost on me. So anyway, if you or someone you know is dealing with long COVID or MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, please head on over to in it for the long haul, all one word, dot substack dot com. In it for the long haul. You'll be able to read stuff there. And if you want to, there's a donate button. I think there's also, there's something about paid subscriptions. I'm not going to make any of the posts I'm not going to put anything behind a paywall, but there is a donate button if you want. And I have gone back with my little team and we've added the donate buttons that I used to have on the website. We've added those back because I know since I stopped doing the premium books, the whole just the books part, that was one of the ways that people supported me and supported the show. And it's not there anymore. So it's no surprise that the funds from that, that I used to rely on have dried up. And then I realized, well, duh, there's no other way between Patreon or the app. And, you know, Patreon takes a big chunk and the app and Apple iTunes takes a big chunk. And so if you want to support the show any way you want, there are now donate buttons that will give you an opportunity to do that. And you don't have to mess with Patreon if you don't want to. And you don't have to mess with the app if you don't want to. Oh, and I also learned, a, this was completely random. I was looking at Diane Antone's YouTube channel. The YouTube algorithm is doing weird things. And the scuttle around is that they're experimenting with AI to help with promoting YouTubers to you based on your viewing history. And... And as a consequence, the last couple of weeks, both on Google and on YouTube, have been very strange. And I am not such a big YouTuber that it has an impact on me and my life. But it is interesting to see just how many people are all of a sudden suffering because that was their main source of income. And Diana Antone asked a question to her viewers and supporters and got lovely responses. And she's particularly unnerved by AI art, which I don't blame her for being. But one of the things that she mentioned was that going to the channel, so it'd be youtube.com at craftlit dash channel, going to the channel page and starting to listen or watch something from there turns out to be enormously important. In your stats, I don't know how, I don't know why, but that apparently is a thing. Eric has gone through and reorganized all of the books that we have on YouTube. So if that's an easy way for you to listen, it's an easy way for you to access it right there. And it'll just keep feeding you the next chapters as you go. We also got our first Three Musketeers voicemail, and I could not be happier. It's from Peggy, and I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again. 
but the Basil Rathbone section absolutely cracked me up. So it's not a short voicemail, but it's a good one. Let's listen. Hi, Heather. This is Peggy from the occasional Tuesday morning crafty chat. Still alive. It's a miracle. But I was starting to listen to the last episode of The Three Musketeers, and you mentioned Gene Kelly and this fencing scene in the movie version that he was in of this marvelous book we're, we're all sharing together. I fenced. <laughs> I have fenced from about eight years old onward. I keep trying to get back into it, but finding an adult fencing group where I can relearn some of the basics because it's been a little while has been has been a challenge but yeah yeah that is an epe um of the three basic fencing swords foil saber epe i have fenced foil the longest but i actually started out with epe and i can tell that the the guards on the sword pommels themselves are a little bit wider to protect your hand because in epe a point is scored anywhere on the body. Everything's fair game. So most FAists will actually hold their non-dominant arm closer to their body because it doesn't count against them. Whereas Gene Kelly, Gene Kelly was clearly trained on foil because on foil, only the torso, front and back, count for your score. And He's holding his off arm, you know, way out there because to tuck your off arm in against your torso while fencing foil is cheating. It's illegal. It's it's cheating. You're covering part of the target. And it'll get you in a lot of trouble. Ask me how I know. No, I'm kidding. I never did that. But, yeah, I, at first, like, they're laughing at him because his stance is completely backwards. and then. When they start to take him seriously again in the garden scene, it's like, oh, okay, he's turned around. He's facing the correct direction. He's turned to the side to keep his body target, you know, minimized. And you were absolutely right when they're trading the blows on the sword blade. They're trading those, those blows in the correct position on the blade. You don't want to whack around with just the tip of your, your blade because that can break. Don't want to necessarily whack around with just the base of the blade because that's a lot of energy to move your whole arm that quickly, that far for just a, a block, for just a parry. And when they're trading the blows, that's actually very significant because they're using gentlemanly fencing rules. In a duel, who cares who, you know, really has the attacking right of way? You get the stab in and go, right? I guess. I don't know. I've never actually fenced a, a duel. I fenced bouts in, you know, the rules of the sport. But to score a point in fencing, you have to have what my former instructor used to call the attacking right of way. And to get that, you have to parry and repost. You can't just lunge at somebody and expect to score. So they're actually using, you know, gentlemen's rules. They're taking it seriously as a duel, but they are also both understanding, hey, we're not here to kill each other. Uh, at least in that, that garden scene, which is about as far in as I was able to get on my tiny little phone as I'm dog sitting for my sister. But yeah, I, I absolutely I love fencing. I, I, did not realize that Gene Kelly was so skilled. I shouldn't be surprised. But uh, if you're also interested, Craftlet listeners, I guess, in other really great movie fencers, Basil Rothborn. Basil Rothborn was a fantastic fencer, like a champion. He taught a bunch of other actors their stunts and so forth, but he always said that the toughest on-screen sword fight he ever, ever had to do was against in the court jester because his co-star, you know, Danny Kay, learned all of the moves or at least tried to, but would get to filming and it would completely fly out of his mind. So he's just swinging the sword all over the place 
And there's Basil Rathborn playing the villain, trying to make it look good. And it looks good. So, yeah, set TV, movie fencing always gets me excited. It was actually my first coach, the SAS, who opened his first class for beginner fencers, in which we little Peggy was attending, with the famous scene from The Princess Bride, and then showed us that. It was like, yeah, you're not going to do any of that. All of that is fake, but it's a good fake. So thank you so much, Crosslet, and thank you, Heather. All right, catch you all on the flip side. Bye. So that made me ridiculously happy. Just... <laughs> Somehow just thinking about Danny Kay thrashing around with an actual sword and Basil Rathbone. Uh, it's just a happy image to have in mind when you're feeling kind of lousy. Also, so good to have experts on deck to explain, yes, there's actually subtext there in the fight scene for you if you know what you're talking about or what you're watching. So that was very exciting. Last crafty thing, and then we're going to get to the book. I put up on my Instagram earlier this week a, a thing that I found that makes it possible for me to practice brush strokes, which is super important in watercolor and very tricky. Practice brush strokes in a way that is non-destructive, doesn't use up watercolor paper, which is crazy expensive. Good cotton watercolor paper, which is the difference between painting on good watercolor paper and just standard run-of-the-mill watercolor paper is the difference between driving on the Audubon and driving on a rutted rural road that has some gravel, some rocks, but definitely washed out areas. It's that big a difference. There are things you just can't do on inexpensive watercolor paper. You can paint with your kid's Crayola crayon watercolor set and come out with great stuff, but you can't do it on bad paper. Anyway, I don't want to spend the money on expensive watercolor paper to practice. And I found a mat. It's for, I think it's for Chinese calligraphy. I, of course, don't know, wouldn't know whether it was Japanese or Chinese. I could tell if it was Korean, but I can't tell the difference between Japanese and Chinese because I don't know what I'm looking for. Either way, however, it's a, a mat. And actually, I got a roll of three mats. They're, you know, cutting board sized, I guess. And they are this thin kind of fabric on one side and kind of like tent material on the other side, thin tent material. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. What it is, is it's a Buddha board, but rolled up. It is a water mat. And mine came with the calligraphy, fill in the blanks, like what color by number kind of stuff, which I love. It gives me a chance to see, can I fit a brush stroke into this area with this brush? What about with this brush? It was kind of nice to have something like a metric to, to work off of even though I'm not trying to teach myself that kind of calligraphy because I'm, I'm so far away from that. But it was a cheap alternative to watercolor paper. And the mat dries off. If I started on the left side of the mat and worked my way practicing to the right side, by the time I hit the right side, the work that I'd done on the left side would have dried off again and I could start over. So yeah, for kids who are learning how to read, spell, write, anybody who's trying to draw or learn brush calligraphy, super useful. And I'll put a, a link to the version of the mats that I purchased in, uh, in the show notes. Alrighty, we have one chapter today. It is a long one, and... It is definitely, very clearly, the first of three linked chapters that are each going to be their own kind of vignette. So today we have the first one. And just as a reminder, when D'Artagnan insulted Porthos in the beginning of the book, which caused the fight scene that Peggy was talking about, it was because of Porthos's vanity and lack of funds. He had that beautiful gold, gold brocaded sash in the front, but it was basically 
cardboard in back, party in the front, business in the back. No, it was the other way around. Anyway, Porthos has an enormous issue with vanity, and you're going to see it on full display today. And Dumas spares no expense in creating a perfect moment for for us to laugh at Porthos. Even though he's supposed to be a great fighter and all of that, Dumas manipulates stuff and and yeah, so that's going to be fun. Listen to the cat and mouse audio play between D'Artagnan and Bonancieux at the beginning of this chapter. It's like a masterclass in characterization because you're understanding more about the plot because of what they say, but you are also getting an enormous amount of characterization about what they say and some subtexts that are going to pay off eventually. So that's pretty fancy footwork there on the writing. Also, Planchet in this chapter is marvelously smart and still hysterically funny. There is a joke that goes by really quickly, that the upshot of which is, just so you can listen for it, because it's written more, more better than what I'm about to say, that it's okay for Planchet to lie because he's not a gentleman. If he were a gentleman, no, 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 you can't lie. But D'Artagnan can lean on him to do the lying for D'Artagnan because Planchet's not a gentleman. Mousqueton and, yes, Mousqueton, Porthos's manservant or lackey. He has a long, he has a couple of long, funny stories that he tells. And they are absolutely like, if this were a play, these would be monologues where everybody stops and listens to the funny guy for a little while. So you get two of them. One is about Catholics and Huguenots or Huguenots in France. I heard, actually, everybody who went on the literary pub crawl in Dublin, anybody who went on the literary pub crawl heard almost exactly the same story told about Irishmen, Protestants, and Catholics. I don't know. I don't know. But they were doing it. It was a scene from a play. And I, for the life of me, am not going to be able to remember what play it was, but I may have written something down in my notebook. So if I can find it, I'll check and see. And if I can, I'll put a link to the text of the play that they were using in the show notes. There's also a story, uh, the second story that Muscaton tells, that is, it has to do with the lasso. And just so it doesn't throw you, it threw me because immediately I said, lasso? Why, that's something that we only had out west. What are they talking about? Lasso. No, it's the lasso. Lariat and lasso. Lariat is the loop that gets thrown. Lasso is the whole thing, the rope and the loop. And yes, lasso ropes are different than regular ropes. They have to be stiffened so that that loop stays open as you throw it over the head of whatever you're trying to lasso. (laughs) But... I found this out. Pharaoh Seti the <laughs> first, in I think it's his tomb or temple in Abydos, twelve eighty before the Common Era. So this is a long time ago. There is a picture on one of the walls of the Pharaoh Seti the first, lassoing a bull. So there's that. And then there are stories about the Huns in 370, modern era, current era, using lassos, which kind of didn't surprise me. What does surprise me is that in both the Victorian translation and in this English translation, the word is lasso. So now we know something that at least I didn't know before, (laughs) just how far back these innovations go. All right. I think that's everything you need before listening. I have one particular piece of information to read to you after the chapter because I don't want to spoil it. So here we go with chapter 25 of The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. 
And if you are listening to the John Lee or anybody else's version of the book, you can fast wind to one hour, 10 minutes and 21 seconds. All right, here we go. Chapter 25 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Porthos Instead of returning directly home, D'Artagnan alighted at the door of Monsieur de Treville and ran quickly up the stairs. This time he had decided to relate all that had passed. Monsieur de Treville would doubtless give him good advice as to the whole affair. Besides, as Monsieur de Treville saw the Queen almost daily, he might be able to draw from Her Majesty some intelligence of the poor young woman, whom they were doubtless making pay very dearly for her devotedness to her mistress. Monsieur de Treville listened to the young man's account with a seriousness which proved that he saw something else in this adventure besides a love affair. When D'Artagnan had finished, he said, hmm. "'All this savors of his eminence a league off!' "'But what is to be done?' said D'Artagnan. "'Nothing, absolutely nothing, at present but quitting Paris, as I told you, as soon as possible. I will see the Queen, I will relate to her the details of the disappearance of this poor woman, of which she is no doubt ignorant. These details will guide her on her part, and on your return I shall perhaps have some good news to tell you. Rely on me.' D'Artagnan knew that although a Gascon, M. de Treville was not in the habit of making promises, and that when by chance he did promise, he more than kept his word. He bowed to him then full of gratitude for the past and for the future, and the worthy captain, who on his side felt a lively interest in this young man, so brave and so resolute, pressed his hand kindly, wishing him a pleasant journey. Determined to put the advice of M. de Treville in practice instantly, D'Artagnan directed his course toward the Rue de Fossoyeurs in order to superintend the packing of his valise. On approaching the house, he perceived M. Bonacieux in mourning costume, standing at his threshold. All that the prudent Planchet had said to him the preceding evening about the sinister character of the old man recurred to the mind of D'Artagnan, who looked at him with more attention than he had done before. In fact, in addition to that yellow, sickly paleness which indicates the insinuation of the bile in the blood, and which might besides be accidental, D'Artagnan remarked something perfidiously significant in the play of the wrinkled features of his countenance. A rogue does not laugh in the same way that an honest man does. A hypocrite does not shed the tears of a man of a good faith. All falsehood is a mask, and however well made the mask may be, with a little attention, we may always succeed in distinguishing it from the true face. It appeared then to D'Artagnan that M. Bonacieux wore a mask, and likewise that that mask was most disagreeable to look upon. In consequence of this feeling of repugnance, he was about to pass without speaking to him, but, as he had done the day before, M. Bonacieux accosted him. "'Well, young man,' said he, we appear to pass rather gay nights, seven o'clock in the morning. Peste! You seem to reverse ordinary customs and come home at the hour when other people are going out. No one can reproach you for anything of the kind, Monsieur Bonacieux, said the young man. You are a model for regular people. It is true that when a man possesses a young and pretty wife, he has no need to seek happiness elsewhere. Happiness comes to meet him, does it not, Monsieur Bonacieux? Bonacieux became as pale as death, and grinned a ghastly smile. Ah, ha, ha, said Bonacieux. You are a jocular companion, but where the devil were you gladding last night, my young master? It does not appear to be very clean in the crossroads. D'Artagnan glanced down at his boots all covered with mud, but that same glance fell upon the shoes and stockings of the mercer, and it might have been said that they had been dipped in the same mud heap. Both were stained with splashes of mud of the same appearance. Then a sudden idea crossed the mind of D'Artagnan. That little stout man, short and elderly, that sort of lackey, 
dressed in dark clothes, treated without ceremony by the men wearing swords who composed the escort, was Bonacieux himself. The husband had presided at the abduction of his wife. A terrible inclination seized D'Artagnan to grasp the mercer by the throat and strangle him. But, as we have said, he was a very prudent youth, and he restrained himself. However, the revolution which appeared upon his countenance was so visible that Bonacieux was terrified at it, and he endeavored to draw back a step or two. But as he was standing before the half of the door which was shut, the obstacle compelled him to keep his place. "'Ah, but you are joking, my worthy man,' said D'Artagnan. It appears to me that if my boots need a sponge, your stockings and shoes stand in equal need of a brush. May you not have been philandering a little also, Monsieur Bonacieux? Oh, the devil! That's unpardonable in a man of your age, and who besides has such a pretty wife as yours. Oh, Lord, no, said Bonacieux. But yesterday I went to St. Mande to make some inquiries after a servant, as I cannot possibly do without one, and the roads were so bad that I brought back all this mud, which I have not yet had time to remove. The place named by Bonacieux as that which had been the object of his journey was a fresh proof in support of the suspicions D'Artagnan had conceived. Bonacieux had named Manda, because Manda was in an exactly opposite direction from St. Cloud. This probability afforded him his first consolation. If Bonacieux knew where his wife was, one might, by extreme means, force the mercer to open his teeth and let his secret escape. The question, then, was how to change this probability into a certainty. "'Pardon, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, if I don't stand upon ceremony,' said D'Artagnan, but nothing makes one so thirsty as want of sleep. I am parched with thirst. Allow me to take a glass of water in your apartment. You know that it is never refused among neighbors. Without waiting for the permission of his host, D'Artagnan went quickly into the house and cast a rapid glance at the bed. It had not been used. Bonacieux had not been a bed. He had only been back an hour or two. He had accompanied his wife to the place of her confinement or else at least to the first relay. "'Thanks, Monsieur Bonacieux,' said D'Artagnan, emptying his glass. "'That is all I wanted of you. I will now go up into my apartment. I will make Planchet brush my boots, and when he has done, I will, if you like, send him to you to brush your shoes.' He left the mercer quite astonished at his singular farewell, and asking himself he had not been a little inconsiderate. At the top of the stairs he found Planchet in a great fright. "'Ah, monsieur!' cried Planchet as soon as he perceived his master. "'Here is more trouble. I thought you would never come in.' "'What's the matter now, Planchet?' demanded D'Artagnan. "'Oh, I give you a hundred, I give you a thousand times to guess, monsieur, the visit I received in your absence.' "'When?' "'About half an hour ago, while you were at Monsieur de Treville's.' "'Who has been here? Come, speak.' "'Monsieur de Cavois.' "'Monsieur de Cavois?' "'In person.' "'The captain of the Cardinal's guards?' "'Himself.' "'Did he come to arrest me?' "'I have no doubt that he did, monsieur, for all his wheedling manner.' "'Was he so sweet, then?' "'Indeed, he was all honey, monsieur.' "'Indeed?' "'He came, he said, on the part of his eminence, who wished you well, and to beg you to follow him to the Palais Royal.' It was called the Palais Cardinal before Richelieu gave it to the king. "'What did you answer him?' "'That the thing was impossible, seeing that you were not at home, as he could see.' "'Well, what did he say, then?' "'That you must not fail to call upon him in the course of the day. "'And then he added in a low voice, "'Tell your master that his eminence is very well disposed toward him, "'and that his fortune, perhaps, depends upon this interview.' "'The snare is rather maladroit for the cardinal,' 
replied the young man, smiling. "'Oh, I saw the snare, and I answered you would be quite in despair on your return.' "'Where has he gone?' asked Monsieur de Cavois. "'To Troya in campaign, I answered. And when did he set out? Yesterday evening.' "'Planchet, my friend,' interrupted D'Artagnan, "'you are really a precious fellow.' "'You will understand, monsieur. I thought there would still be time, if you wish, to see Monsieur de Cavois to contradict me by saying you were not yet gone. The falsehood would then lie at my door, and as I am not a gentleman, I may be allowed to lie. "'Be of good heart, Planchet. You shall preserve your reputation as a voracious man. In a quarter of an hour we set off.' "'That's the advice I was about to give, monsieur.' "'And where are we going, may I ask, without being too curious?' "'Pardieu, in the opposite direction to that which you said I was gone. "'Besides, are you not as anxious to learn news of Grimaud, Mousqueton, and Bazin "'as I am to know what has become of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis?' "'Yes, monsieur,' said Planchet, "'and I will go as soon as you please.' Indeed, I think provincial air will suit us much better just now than the air of Paris. So then. So then, pack up your luggage, Planchet, and let us be off. On my part, I will go out with my hands in my pockets, that nothing may be suspected. You may join me at the Hotel de Garde. By the way, Planchet, I think you are right with respect to our host, and that he is decidedly a frightfully low wretch. Ah, monsieur! You may take my word when I tell you anything. I am a physiognomist, I assure you. D'Artagnan went out first, as had been agreed upon. Then, in order that he might have nothing to reproach himself with, he directed his steps for the last time toward the residences of his three friends. No news had been received of them. Only a letter, all perfumed and of an elegant writing and small characters, had come for Aramis. D'Artagnan took charge of it. Ten minutes afterward, Planchet joined him at the stables of the Hotel de Garde. D'Artagnan, in order that there might be no time lost, had saddled his horse himself. "'That's well,' said he to Planchet, when the latter added the portmanteau to the equipment. "'Now saddle the other three horses.' "'Do you think, then, monsieur, that we shall travel faster with two horses apiece?' said Planchet with his shrewd air. "'No, monsieur Jester.' replied d'artagnan but with our four horses we may bring back our three friends if we should have the good fortune to find them living which is a great chance replied planchet but we must not despair of the mercy of god amen said d'artagnan getting into his saddle as they went from the hotel de garde they separated leaving the street at opposite ends one having to quit paris by the barriere de la villette and the other by the Berrier Montmartre, to meet again beyond St. Denis, a strategic maneuver which, having been executed with equal punctuality, was crowned with the most fortunate results. D'Artagnan and Planchet entered Pierrefitte together. Planchet was more courageous, it must be admitted, by day than by night. His natural prudence, however, never forsook him for a single instant. He had forgotten not one of the incidents of the first journey, and he looked upon everybody he met on the road as an enemy. It followed that his hat was forever in his hand, which procured him some severe reprimands from D'Artagnan, who feared that his excess of politeness would lead people to think he was the lackey of a man of no consequence. Nevertheless, whether the passengers were really touched by the urbanity of Planchet, or whether this time nobody was posted on the young man's road, our two travellers arrived at Chantilly without any accident, and alighted at the tavern of Great St. Martin, the same at which they had stopped on their first journey. The host, on seeing a young man followed by a lackey with two extra horses, advanced respectfully to the door. Now, as they had already travelled eleven leagues, D'Artagnan thought it time to stop, whether Porthos were or were not in the inn. Perhaps it would not be prudent to ask at once what had become of the musketeer, the result of these reflections was that D'Artagnan, without asking information of any kind, alighted, commended the horses to the care of his lackey, 
entered a small room destined to receive those who wished to be alone, and desired the host to bring him a bottle of his best wine, and as good a breakfast as possible, a desire which further corroborated the high opinion the innkeeper had formed of the traveler at first sight. D'Artagnan was therefore served with miraculous celerity. The regiment of the guards was recruited among the first gentlemen of the kingdom, and D'Artagnan, followed by a lackey and traveling with four magnificent horses, despite the simplicity of his uniform, could not fail to make a sensation. The host desired himself to serve him, which D'Artagnan, perceiving, ordered two glasses to be brought, and commenced the following conversation. "'My faith, my good host,' said D'Artagnan, filling the two glasses, "'I asked for a bottle of your best wine, and if you have deceived me, you will be punished in what you have sinned. For seeing that I hate drinking by myself, you shall drink with me. Take your glass, then, and let us drink. But what shall we drink to, so as to avoid wounding any susceptibility? Let us drink to the prosperity of your establishment. Your lordship does me much honor, said the host, and I thank you sincerely for your kind wish. But don't mistake, said D'Artagnan, there is more selfishness in my toast than perhaps you may think, for it is only in prosperous establishments that one is well received. In hotels that do not flourish, everything is in confusion, and the traveler is a victim to the embarrassments of his host. Now I travel a great deal, particularly on this road, and I wish to see all innkeepers making a fortune. It seems to me, said the host, that this is not the first time I have had the honor of seeing, monsieur. Bah! I have passed perhaps ten times through Chantilly, and out of the ten times I have stopped three or four times at your house at least. Why, I was here only ten or twelve days ago. I was conducting some friends, musketeers, one of whom, by the by, had a dispute with a stranger, a man who sought a quarrel with him for I don't know what. Exactly so said the host. I remember it perfectly. It is not Monsieur Porthos that your lordship means. Yes, that is my companion's name. My God, my dear host, tell me if anything has happened to him. Your lordship must have observed that he could not continue his journey. Why, to be sure, he promised to rejoin us, and we have seen nothing of him. He has done us the honor to remain here. What? He had done you the honor to remain here? Yes, monsieur, in this house, and we are even a little uneasy. On what account? Of certain expenses he has contracted. Well, but whatever expenses he may have incurred, I am sure he is in a condition to pay them. Ah, monsieur, you infuse genuine balm into my blood. We have made considerable advances, and this morning the surgeon declared that if monsieur Porthos did not pay him, he should look to me, as it was I who had sent for him. Porthos is wounded, then? I cannot tell you, monsieur. What? You cannot tell me? Surely you ought to be able to tell me better than any other person. Yes, but in our situation we must not say all we know, particularly as we have been warned that our ears should answer for our tongues. Well, can I see Porthos? Certainly, monsieur. Take the stairs on your right. Go up the first flight and knock at number one, only warn him that it is you. Why should I do that? Uh, because, monsieur, some mischief might happen to you. Of what kind? In the name of wonder. Monsieur Porthos may imagine you belong to the house, and in a fit of passion might run his sword through you or blow out your brains. What have you done to him, then? We have asked him for money. The devil! Ah, I can understand that. It is a demand that Porthos takes very ill when he is not in funds. But I know he must be so at present. We thought so too, monsieur, 
as our house is carried on very regularly, and we make out our bills every week, at the end of eight days we presented our account, but it appeared we had chosen an unlucky moment, for at the first word on the subject he sent us all to the devils. It is true he had been playing the day before. Playing the day before? And with whom? Lord, who can say, monsieur? With some gentleman who was traveling this way, to whom he proposed a game of La Squenet. That's it, then. And the foolish fellow lost all he had. Even to his horse, monsieur. For when the gentleman was about to set out, we perceived that his lackey was saddling Monsieur Porthos's horse, as well as his master's. When we observed this to him, he told us all to trouble ourselves about our own business, as this horse belonged to him. We also informed Monsieur Porthos of what was going on, but he told us we were scoundrels to doubt a gentleman's word, and that as he had said the horse was his, it must be so. That's Porthos all over, murmured D'Artagnan. Then, continued the host, I reply that as from the moment we seemed not likely to come to a good understanding with respect to payment, I hoped that he would have at least the kindness to grant the favor of his custom to my brother, host of the Golden Eagle. But Monsieur Porthos replied that my house being the best, he should remain where he was. This reply was too flattering to allow me to insist on his departure. I confined myself then to begging him to give up his chamber, which is the handsomest in the hotel, and to be satisfied with a pretty little room on the third floor. But to this, Monsieur Porthos replied that as he every moment expected his mistress, who was one of the greatest ladies in the court, I might easily comprehend that the chamber he did me the honor to occupy in my house was itself very mean for the visit of such a personage. Nevertheless, while acknowledging the truth of what he said, I thought proper to insist, but without even giving himself the trouble to enter into any discussion with me, he took one of his pistols, laid it on his table day and night, and said that at the first word that should be spoken to him about removing— either within the house or out of it, he would blow out the brains of the person who should be so imprudent as to meddle with a matter which only concerned himself. Since that time, monsieur, nobody entered his chamber but his servant. What? Mousqueton is here, then? Oh, yes, monsieur. Five days after your departure he came back, and in a very bad condition, too. It appears that he had met with disagreeableness likewise on his journey. Unfortunately, he is more nimble than his master, so that for the sake of his master he puts us all under his feet, and as he thinks we might refuse what he asked for, he takes all he wants without asking at all. The fact is, said D'Artagnan, I have always observed a great degree of intelligence and devotedness in Mousqueton. That is possible, monsieur, but suppose I should happen to be brought in contact, even four times a year, with such intelligence and devotedness, why, I should be a ruined man. No, for Porthos will pay you. Huh, said the host in a doubtful tone. The favorite of a great lady will not be allowed to be inconvenienced for such a paltry sum as he owes you. If I durst say what I believe on that head. What do you believe? I ought rather to say what I know. What you know? And even what I am sure of. And of what are you so sure? I would say that I know this great lady. You? Yes, I. And how do you know her? Oh, monsieur, if I could believe I might trust in your discretion. Speak. By the word of a gentleman, you shall have no cause to repent of your confidence. Well, monsieur, you understand that uneasiness makes us do many things. What have you done? 
Oh, nothing which was not right in the character of a creditor. Well? Monsieur Porthos gave us a note for his duchess, ordering us to put it in the post. This was before his servant came. As he could not leave his chamber, it was necessary to charge us with this commission. And then? Instead of putting the letter in the post, which is never safe, I took advantage of the journey of one of my lads to Paris, and ordered him to convey the letter to this duchess himself. This was fulfilling the intentions of Monsieur Porthos, who had desired us to be so careful of this letter, was it not? Nearly so. Well, monsieur, do you know who this great lady is? No, I have heard Porthos speak of her, that's all. Do you know who this pretended duchess is? I repeat to you, I don't know her. Why, she is the old wife of a procurator of the Chatelet, monsieur named Madame Coquenard, who, although she is at least fifty, still gives herself jealous airs. It struck me as very odd that a princess should live in the Rue aux Hours. But how do you know all this? Because she flew into a great passion on receiving the letter, saying that Monsieur Porthos was a weathercock, and that she was sure it was for some woman he had received this wound. Has he been wounded then? Oh, good Lord, what have I said? You said that Porthos had received a sword cut. Yes, but he has forbidden me so strictly to say so. And why so? Zounds, monsieur, because he had boasted that he would perforate the stranger with whom you left him in dispute, whereas the stranger, on the contrary, in spite of all his rodomontades, quickly threw him on his back. As Monsieur Porthos is a very boastful man, he insists that nobody shall know he has received this wound except the Duchess, whom he endeavored to interest by an account of his adventure. Is it a wound that confines him to his bed? Ah, and a master stroke too, I assure you. Your friend's soul must stick tight to his body. Were you there, then? Monsieur, I followed them from curiosity, so that I saw the combat without the combatant seeing me. And what took place? Oh, the affair was not long, I assure you. They placed themselves on guard. The stranger made a feint and a lunge, and that so rapidly that when Monsieur Porthos came to the parade, he had already three inches of steel in his breast. He immediately fell backward. The stranger placed the point of his sword at his throat, and Monsieur Porthos, finding himself at the mercy of his adversary, acknowledged himself conquered, upon which the stranger asked his name, and learning that it was Porthos, and not D'Artagnan, he assisted him to rise, brought him back to the hotel, mounted his horse, and disappeared. So it was with Monsieur D'Artagnan this stranger meant to quarrel? It appears so. And do you know what has become of him? No, I never saw him until that moment, and have not seen him since. Very well, uh, I know all that I wish to know. Porthos' chamber is, you say, on the first story, number one? Yes, monsieur, the handsomest in the inn, a chamber that I could have let ten times over. Bah, be satisfied said D'Artagnan, laughing. Porthos will pay you with the money of the Duchess Coquenard. Ah, monsieur, procurator's wife or duchess, if she will but loosen her purse-strings, it will be all the same. But she positively answered that she was tired of the exigencies and infidelities of monsieur Porthos, and that she would not send him a denier. And did you convey this answer to your guest? We took good care not to do that. He would have found in what fashion we had executed his commission. So that he still expects his money? 
"'Oh, Lord, yes, monsieur. Yesterday he wrote again, but it was his servant who this time put the letter in the post.' "'Do you say the procurator's wife is old and ugly?' Fifty, at least, monsieur, and not at all handsome, according to Batard's account. "'In that case you may be quite at ease. She will soon be softened. Besides, Porthos cannot owe you much.' "'How, not much? Twenty good pistoles already, without reckoning the doctor. He denies himself nothing. It may be easily seen he has been accustomed to live well.' Never mind if his mistress abandons him. He will find friends, I will answer for it. So, my dear host, be not uneasy, and continue to take all the care of him that his situation requires. Monsieur has promised me not to open his mouth about the procurator's wife, and not to say a word of the wound. That's agreed. You have my word. Oh, he would kill me. Don't be afraid. He is not so much of a devil as he appears. Saying these words, D'Artagnan went upstairs, leaving his host a little better satisfied with respect to two things in which he appeared to be very much interested, his debt and his life. At the top of the stairs, upon the most conspicuous door of the corridor, was traced in black ink a gigantic number, one. D'Artagnan knocked, and upon the bidding to come in which came from inside, he entered the chamber. Porthos was in bed and was playing a game at Lansquenet with Mousqueton to keep his hand in, while a spit loaded with partridges was turning before the fire, and on each side of a large chimney-piece over two chafing-dishes were boiling two stew-pans, from which exhaled a double odor of rabbit and fish stews, rejoicing to the smell. In addition to this, he perceived that the top of a wardrobe and the marble of a commode were covered with empty bottles. At the sight of his friend, Porthos uttered a loud cry of joy, and Mousqueton, rising respectfully, yielded his place to him, and went to give an eye to the two stewpans, of which he appeared to have the particular inspection. "'Ah, pardieu! Is that you?' said Porthos to D'Artagnan. "'You are right welcome. Excuse my not coming to meet you, but,' added he, looking at D'Artagnan with a certain degree of uneasiness, "'You know what has happened to me?' "'No.' "'Has the host told you nothing, then?' "'I asked after you and came up as soon as I could.' Porthos seemed to breathe more freely. "'And what has happened to you, my dear Porthos?' continued D'Artagnan. "'Why, on making a thrust at my adversary, whom I had already hit three times, and whom I meant to finish with the fourth, I put my foot on a stone, slipped, and strained my knee. Truly? Honor, luckily for the rascal, for I should have left him dead on the spot, I assure you. And what has become of him? Oh, I don't know, he had enough, and set off without waiting for the rest. But you, my dear D'Artagnan, what has happened to you? "'So that this strain of the knee,' continued D'Artagnan, "'my dear Porthos keeps you in bed?' "'My God, that's all. I shall be about again in a few days.' "'Why did you not have yourself conveyed to Paris? You must be cruelly bored here.' "'That was my intention, but, my dear friend, I have one thing to confess to you.' "'What's that?' It is that as I was cruelly bored, as you say, and as I had the seventy-five pistoles in my pocket, which you had distributed to me, in order to amuse myself I invited a gentleman who was traveling this way to walk up and proposed a cast of dice. He accepted my challenge, and my faith, my seventy-five pistoles passed from my pocket to his, without reckoning my horse, which he won into the bargain." "'But you, my dear D'Artagnan—' "'What can you expect, my dear Porthos? "'A man is not privileged in all ways,' said D'Artagnan. "'You know the proverb, unlucky at play, lucky in love. "'You are too fortunate in your love for play not to take its revenge. 
What consequence can the reverses of fortune be to you? Have you not, happy rogue that you are, have you not your duchess, who cannot fail to come to your aid? Well, you see, my dear D'Artagnan, with what ill luck I play, replied Porthos, with the most careless air in the world. I wrote to her to send me fifty louis or so, of which I stood absolutely in need on account of my accident. Well? Well, she must be at her country seat, for she has not answered me. Truly? No. So yesterday I addressed another epistle to her, still more pressing than the first. But you are here, my dear fellow. Let us speak of you, I confess. I began to be very uneasy on your account. But your host behaves very well toward you, as it appears, my dear Porthos, said D'Artagnan, directing the sick man's attention to the full stewpans and the empty bottles. So, so, replied Porthos. Only three or four days ago the impertinent jackanapes gave me his bill and I was forced to turn both him and his bill out the door, so that I am here something in the fashion of a conqueror, holding my position, as it were, my conquest. So you see, being in constant fear of being forced from that position, I am armed to the teeth. And yet, said D'Artagnan, laughing, it appears to me that from time to time you must make sorties and he again pointed to the bottles and the stew-pans. "'Not I, unfortunately,' said Porthos. "'This miserable strain confines me to my bed, but Mousqueton forages and brings in provisions. Friend Mousqueton, you see that we have a reinforcement, and we must have an increase of supplies.' "'Mousqueton,' said D'Artagnan, "'you must render me a service.' "'What, monsieur?' You must give your recipe to Planchet. I may be besieged in my turn, and I shall not be sorry for him to be able to let me enjoy the same advantages with which you gratify your master. "'Lord, monsieur, there is nothing more easy,' said Mousqueton with a modest air. "'One only needs to be sharp, that's all. I was brought up in the country, and my father in his leisure time was something of a poacher.' "'And what did he do the rest of his time?' Monsieur, he carried on a trade which I have always thought satisfactory. Which? As it was a time of war between the Catholics and the Huguenots, and as he saw the Catholics exterminate the Huguenots, and the Huguenots exterminate the Catholics, all in the name of religion, he adopted a mixed belief which permitted him to be sometimes Catholic, sometimes a Huguenot. Now he was accustomed to walk with his fowling piece on his shoulder behind the hedges which border the roads, and when he saw a Catholic coming, the Protestant religion immediately prevailed in his mind. He lowered his gun in the direction of the traveler. Then, when he was within ten paces of him, he commenced a conversation, which almost always ended by the traveler's abandoning his purse to save his life. It goes without saying that when he saw a Huguenot coming, he felt himself filled with such ardent Catholic zeal that he could not understand how, a quarter of an hour before, he had been able to have any doubts upon the superiority of our holy religion. For my part, monsieur, I am Catholic, my father, faithful to his principles, having made my elder brother a Huguenot." "'And what was the end of this worthy man?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Oh, the most unfortunate kind, monsieur. "'One day he was surprised in a lonely road "'between a Huguenot and a Catholic, "'with both of whom he had before had business, "'and who both knew him again, "'so they united against him and hanged him on a tree. "'Then they came and boasted of their fine exploit "'in the cabaret of the next village,' where my brother and I were drinking. "'And what did you do?' said D'Artagnan. "'We let them tell their story out,' replied Mousqueton. "'Then, as in leaving the cabaret they took different directions, my brother went and hid himself on the road of the Catholic, and I on that of the Huguenot. Two hours after all was over, 
We had done the business of both, admiring the foresight of our poor father, who had taken the precaution to bring each of us up in a different religion. Well, I must allow, as you say, your father was a very intelligent fellow, and you say in his leisure moments the worthy man was a poacher. Yes, monsieur, and it was he who taught me to lay a snare and a ground line. The consequence is that when I saw our laborers, which did not at all suit two such delicate stomachs as ours, I had recourse to a little of my old trade. While walking near the wood of Monsieur le Prince, I laid a few snare in the runs, and while reclining on the banks of His Highness's pieces of water, I slipped a few lines into his fish ponds, so that now, thanks be to God, we do not want, as Monsieur can testify, for partridges, rabbits, carp, or eels, all light, wholesome food suitable for the sick. But the wine, said D'Artagnan, who furnishes the wine, your host? That is to say, yes and no. How yes and no? He furnishes it, it is true, but he does not know that he has that honor. <laughs> Explain yourself, Mousqueton. Your conversation is full of instructive things. That's it, monsieur. It has so chanced that I met with a Spaniard in my peregrinations who had seen many countries, and among them the New World. What connection can the New World have with the bottles which are on the commode and the wardrobe? Patience, monsieur, everything will come in its turn. This Spaniard had in his service a lackey who had accompanied him in his voyage to Mexico. This lackey was my compatriot, and we became the more intimate from there being many resemblances of character between us. We loved sporting of all kinds better than anything, so that he related to me how in the plains of the Pampas, the natives hunt the tiger and the wild bull with simple running nooses which they throw to a distance of twenty or thirty paces, the end of a cord with such nicety, but in the face of the proof I was obliged to acknowledge the truth of the recital. My friend placed a bottle at the distance of thirty paces, and at each cast he caught the neck of the bottle in his running noose. I practiced this exercise— and as nature has endowed me with some faculties, at this day I can throw the lasso with any man in the world. Well, do you understand, monsieur? Our host has a well-furnished cellar, the key of which never leaves him. Only this cellar has a ventilating hole. Now through this ventilating hole I throw my lasso, and as I now know in which part of the cellar is the best wine— that's my point for sport. You see, monsieur, what the new world has to do with the bottles which are on the commode and the wardrobe. Now, will you taste our wine and, without prejudice, say what you think of it? Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Unfortunately, I have just breakfasted. Well, said Porthos, Arrange the table, Mousqueton, and while we breakfast, D'Artagnan will relate to us what has happened to him during the ten days since he left us. Willingly, said D'Artagnan. While Porthos and Mousqueton were breakfasting, with the appetites of convalescence, and with that brotherly cordiality which unites men in misfortune, D'Artagnan related how Aramis, being wounded, was obliged to stop at Crevacore how he had left Athos fighting at Amiens with four men who accused him of being a coiner, and how he, D'Artagnan, had been forced to run the Comte de Ward through the body in order to reach England. But there the confidence of D'Artagnan stopped. He only added that on his return from Great Britain he had brought back four magnificent horses, one for himself and one for each of his companions. Then he informed Porthos that the one intended for him was already installed in the stable of the tavern. At this moment, Planchet entered to inform his master that the horses were sufficiently refreshed and that it would be possible to sleep at Clermont. As D'Artagnan was tolerably reassured with regard to Porthos, and as he was anxious to obtain news of his two other friends, he held out his hand to the wounded man and told him he was about to resume his route in order to continue his researches. 
For the rest, as he reckoned upon returning by the same route in seven or eight days, if Porthos were still at the great St. Martin, he would call for him on his way. Porthos replied that in all probability his brain would not permit him to depart yet a while. Besides, it was necessary he should stay at Chantilly to await for the answer from his duchess. D'Artagnan wished that answer might be prompt and favorable, and having again recommended Porthos to the care of Mousqueton, and paid his bill to the host, he resumed his route with Planchet, already relieved of one of his led horses. End of chapter 25 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. All right, so first activity, hook up with Porthos, find out what's going on. Why did he not catch up with D'Artagnan? Now we know. <laughs> oh, D'Artagnan's a good guy for keeping his mouth shut, right? I mean, he could have been a real jerk. And told Porthos, I know what you did. But no, he is a good guy. He proves it over and over again. And then there are some times when he won't be such a good guy. And will be annoyed. But we have to remember all the good stuff. So the thing I wanted to read to you is a footnote from my newer translation copy. The woman who is Porthos's honey on the side... The way it sounds in the Victorian and in the modern translation is that she is a lawyer, procureuse. I'm just going to read it to you. French has feminine equivalents of masculine titles. Madame Coquenard is the wife of a procureur or a prosecutor. She is not a procuress. The Grand Châtelet seat of the criminal courts was one of the most sinister buildings in Paris. It was demolished in 1802. It is also not unlike in Shakespeare's day where, you know, I've got a good idea, let's kill all the lawyers. Being a lawyer was not a particularly valued or, oh, I'm so happy to meet you kind of profession. So that's, oh, Porthos has, <laughs> has a mistress who is both not young and hot, but also not a duchess and rich. The lawyers were absolutely middle class. And she's ticked at him. <laughs> but, wow, okay, going back to the beginning, Bonantier, right, continues to be such a jerk. And I, I loved the description when D'Artagnan figured out, based on the mud on their boots the color of the mud on their boots, that they had both been in the same place and that same place was where Constance was kidnapped. When D'Artagnan figured that out, he got so angry that he couldn't hide it on his face. And Bonancier had no idea why he's so ticked off, but was scared. And I thought, that's some interesting characterization right there. Because D'Artagnan, so far as we can tell at this point in the book, has been masterful at hiding whatever is going on in his head and keeping it off his face. But not here. I also love that Planchet set up another, oh, it's not D'Artagnan moment for the Cardinals, guys. He went that away. The opposite of the way we're going right now. Smart cookie, that man. Love him. All right. I think that is everything I have for you. Thank you again, those of you who have gone to Patreon. I'll be reading out names as we go along. And thank you for going over and donating. I really appreciate that too. And like I said, if you or anyone you know has somebody who's dealing with long COVID or MECFS, please give them the link to initforthelonghaul.substack.com and they can sign up to get posts from, from there. <sighs> yeah, it's going to take a while. But I also want to make sure that people who are dealing with this also have a place to share their information. So I'm leaving the comments sections open on the posts, which I know is kind of 
dangerous. But I've tried to make it clear that I, I will delete posts that are obnoxious. So I want to keep it like a craft lit place, full of really smart, curious, wonderful people. So thank you for being smart, curious, and wonderful. Oh, and I almost forgot. This Thursday, the 31st, so before the next episode drops, we will have our Patreon patron book party for the Librarian of Burned Books over on Discord. Head over to patreon.com and you'll find all of the information you need to find there. If you have any questions, you can ping any of us, uh, me, Eric, Chemuel, any of us can help you. And I mentioned a while ago that there were some adjustments that were being made at Patreon. One of those things is that you can up your support for a month if you want to participate in something that you aren't supporting at the level for. Wow, that was a horrible, horrible sentence, but it means that you can adjust your level of support and join us for a movie party or a book party as you wish. Our next movie party, this will be for September, is going to be a replay of A Face in the Crowd. I think we both agreed it's worth it. So I hope to see you at the book party and also in September for A Face in the Crowd. All right, you take care of yourself. Have a great week. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Bye.